Let me kick off the whole thing. So uh, welcome to Investor Ready Life events organized by Hubski. You will find here all things fundraising, advice and tangible tactics that work best today from entrepreneurs, investors and tech industry experts. And I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome today Neil Cooker, who is a founder of multiple businesses, including Crump, Pledger, Dizzy Jump, Cardiff Start, and uh, sits on the board of the UK Government Technology and the Business Cluster Alliance. Uh, Neil, welcome to the show. Great to have you here. Uh, yeah, can you give us a bit more background about who you are and what you do? Yeah, um, I am, well, first and foremost, I'm an, uh, an entrepreneur, uh, and I've been an entrepreneur basically pretty much since I left university. I set up a uh, record label with some friends after I left university, and that uh, was a five, ten year journey of great fun, but not making much money. Uh, we had a lot of uh, exciting times flying around the world, playing records, releasing music, releasing other people's music. Um, and that was about 15 years ago that uh, I kind of came out of that. Uh, it was It's a very tough industry, uh, it's a tough industry to make money, it's a tough industry to survive, um, but we had an incredible amount of fun doing it. Uh, it was very much a uh, lifestyle business. Um, and then shortly after that, I realized there was a gap in the market really for a merchandise uh, platform for the music industry. So. If you have a lot of capital, if you have a lot of resources, you can um, be very successful with merchandise. Uh, if you're Coldplay, you can print 10,000 copies of a, uh, a T-shirt and, you know, up front for a couple of pounds each and sell them for 20 pounds. And, you know, but but it's it's very much predicated on if you have the, the capital and the resources. So we set up Dizzy Jam as a print on demand platform for the music industry, taking mine and my business partner's insights from um, the music industry and, and you know, so we help lots of uh, bands, record labels, music makers, DJs create and sell merchandise. So there's no no cost to them. They just upload a design and start selling. Um, and alongside that, we also run a screen printing uh, platform. So again, just uh, we, we're trying to be a uh, what I would call probably a smart broker for the T-shirt printing industry. Just trying to uh, rather than be printers, trying to use technology to solve problems around uh, either buying or selling merchandise. So that's um, that's uh, something I've been working on for a number of years. And increasingly now I work with startups and enterprise uh, platforms and enterprise organizations to help people validate, uh, reduce failure rates, uh, and just turn good ideas into good businesses. I'm a strong believer that a good idea isn't necessarily a good business. And there's a, there's a lot of work to be done after having a good idea before it turned into a good business. I agree. I agree 100% with that, Neil. So it, it's it's a really interesting journey. Like, uh, so you 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 operated in in the music industry for around 10, 15 years, and that allowed you to really build that expertise in mm -hmm. the field. And then you went on and built a, a merchandise like a marketplace for people to print. Uh, all sort of stuff was that just t-shirts or there was a bit, bit more that to that yeah i mean we you know the the platform basically does a, a whole bunch of different stuff i mean you know you can do everything from mugs to t-shirts and uh yeah i mean to be honest i would say t-shirts is probably accounts for 70 percent of our revenue just because t-shirts are the classic uh bit of merchandise particularly for the music industry right so uh, having a band's t-shirt um is a uh, is absolutely a necessity so you know obviously we sell hoodies and tote bags and posters and, and other bits and pieces but yes mm -hmm. t-shirts is a uh, t-shirts is the main bit i see i see like interestingly i spoke not long ago with a company doing something very similar in a print mer merchandise uh, sector and they were like fundraising at the time and they already closed their round uh, but uh like how how did you realize that like what made there is a gap in the market? Or it seems to be like fairly like saturated market. What made you think yeah. that like that's the way I want to go for? It absolutely is a saturated market. I mean, there's hundreds, if not thousands, of people who do similar things to what we do. And I think uh, depending on how you position yourself in the market and how you address a niche, um, it's very easy to be 
just you know i'm actually mentoring uh, a young business at the moment who are have a print on demand platform and you know they're they're really trying to find a niche in which they can operate because unless you do then you're just going to be swallowed up uh, by the market um to be honest back then uh, which was probably 10 12 years ago uh, and this is kind of what took me on my kind of I suppose my mentoring and helping with validating journey um, is that um, Cardiff a decade ago, I'm based in Cardiff in South Wales, capital of Wales, really is not much of a tech uh, cluster or hub. And so I found myself having to uh, make the rules up myself. Um, and, you know, me and my co-founders really had no support in building a tech business and we actually came from the music industry so we were pretty dumb in some respects we tried to build it with no knowledge of how to scale a tech platform we were trying to build a t-shirt printing business with a website and we had no idea that there was an immense difference you know we wasted the first handful of years um just building something that really the market wasn't quite ready for or didn't need or you know we had we did no validation we did no um, mm. some research. Yeah, we did some bits and pieces, but none of it was um, none of it was particularly good quality research. Um, and so it was over the next couple of years that really we we ended up making so many mistakes, like a ridiculous amount of mis mistakes. Um, and that's why I, you know, I ended up building a a community um, around tech startups in South Wales because there weren't really any successful tech founders to share their knowledge with other tech founders. So it was very difficult to learn. You could read all the blogs, you could read all the stuff coming out of Y Combinator, Silicon Valley, whatever, but there's nobody who, who you could take for a pint and say, how did you do this? How did you raise this money? How did you scale? How did you employ people? So I thought, well, let's pull a, pull a community uh, together and um, we'll uh, see what happens. And, you know, that that's how... I've ended up getting involved with governments and various bits and pieces uh, and helping grow uh, mm -hmm. systems and clusters because sometimes you have to do it a peer-to-peer -peer level rather than top down if there's nobody in your cluster who's dripping the the sort of the knowledge down into the community then you have to kind of uh, support each other uh, horizontally yeah so uh, neil I'd, I'd love to speak so you touched on a few really important subjects here so uh, one it's like uh, product market fit, this early days validation and how, how, you, how you really make it work, how you then, in case of fundraising, like how, how do you generate this early traction, how you generate these numbers that get people excited. And uh, from your experience, like when did you, like, or maybe you mentioned as well some of your mistakes. So from your experience, maybe if you can name like three top mistakes most founders do, your mm. experience. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. certainly one thing that we did, uh, we did a couple, you know, a number of things wrong, as I say, I think obviously not validating, and I'll come back to that in a second. Um, we, uh, I don't think we moved, we didn't structure ourselves as a startup in the early days because we didn't think of ourselves as a tech business. We didn't structure ourselves for um, rapid movement and rapid iteration, you know, those rapid sort of cycles of development um we kind of built something that we thought would do the job and then uh have you know but didn't really you know there was no we had no concept of minimum viable product it was like we went and got someone who could build the whole thing for us and and you know so that was a big mistake i think that those fundamentally were the big mistakes and i think they could have been prevented by somebody going for a coffee with us in the early days and go, you're doing this all wrong. Like, I would advise myself now, 10 years on, completely differently. And a lot of it's about the validation thing. And that's something I'm quite, I spend a lot of my time working on with new startups now is um, doing that. And so I did a, did a survey not too long ago, actually. Uh, we asked about 100 startups about their, the journey they went through in terms of coming up with an idea and, and, uh, and getting to market and all that stuff. What was really interesting was there's a very, very strong disconnect between what people understood, the, the importance with which people understood uh, validation. They, they realized that validation is absolutely very, very important, 
but that was not backed up with how much validation they did. So we interviewed and, and sort of surveyed like 100 startups and the majority were saying, you know, when you ask them which of these 10 things are the most important, validation always came near the top. But then when you ask them the same startups, how much validation did you do? Almost all of those early stage startups were going, well, none. And you're like, right, that's, that's crazy, right? That's what, why, what, you know, you know you've, read, you've read the mom test, you've, you've read all the blogs, you've read Paul Graham's blogs, you've read Steve Blank, you've read the, you know, Lean Startup, and yet you're not doing it. Uh, because I think the, the counterpoint to that is that we are also flooded. There's a really good book called The Entrepreneurship Myth, I think it's called, that talks about we're flooded with this imagery of these iconic, legendary entrepreneurs who are very loud, very confident, very in your face, Gary V, Elon Musk, Richard Branson, these people who make a lot of noise. And it reinforces the image that um, the entrepreneurship is about genius and just working incredibly hard, right? So if, if you're a genius and you work very hard, you will effectively. And so what it doesn't actually tell you is like, entrepreneurship is a process, like, there's a lot of luck in there as well and there's a lot of other skills but fundamentally it's a process like and that's why you know most of the rich people you see tend to be middle-aged and older right because it's taken them 20 years to go through the process two or three times four or five times to realize what it is that they have to learn mm. you know I, I, I was once speaking to somebody very wealthy and i was like so tell me about sort of earning these millions of pounds how hard was it you know we were talking he said well the first million I made was almost impossible. He said the second million was very hard. The third million was quite hard. He said after the fourth million, it kind of got pretty easy, you know, because he just learned, you know, and he was able to like take what he'd learned in doing this thing and he just applied those those rules and uh, what worked for him. And so, you know, I think we get into the habit of thinking we don't need to validate because all the media tells us is you just need a brilliant idea. So things like Dragon's Den and all that kind of thing, they're like, that's a brilliant idea. But nobody has ever says, it's a brilliant idea. Now go and spend a month proving to me that it will be a good business. Okay, Neil. Point. So, I mean, we both met like hundreds of people, hundreds of businesses. They, they come to us mm -hmm. and they're like, they need a bit of a guidance. And uh, what we do, we, we would spend like a one hour, like two hours, half an hour here on the call. Like, if you can give an advice to someone with just an idea, early days, early days, just an idea, or maybe just started working on their MVP and they need to like validate the market, what would you say to them? What they should do? Like, like some, like a practical advice that they, they could apply right now. Um, it's, it sounds like a, it's a piece of advice that I think people don't like to hear, but Genuinely, the one book I think that has changed my perspective on entrepreneurship was The Mom Test by Rob Fitzpatrick. I mean, that's always been a bit of a, um, a cornerstone for me in terms of it trains. So it, it's a very short book. It takes like two or three hours to read. Um, and, it, and it basically teaches you how to get away with the ego-driven obsession that your idea is brilliant um and actually go and it teaches you how to speak to people to find out if you've got more than just an idea um so that for me is normally step number one i've got like I, i've actually i've got a, a whole validation process that i uh, uh, i've written up on my website it's fairly easy to find as a blog post um and that for me is uh simply a case of finding your potential target audience and speaking to them in the right way. It's not difficult. Uh, you just have to be disciplined about how you speak to people. Um, and Rob's book, The Mom Test, teaches you how to do that. Um, and nothing guarantees success, right? You, you could do all the research in the world, you can do all the validation in the world, you can spend, you know, go through, burn through lots and lots of different uh, minimum viable products, and you still might fail. That can't be, um, that can't be stressed enough. But when you see that the statistics repeatedly show that the biggest reason for, for product failure is no market need, in other words, people just didn't want what you were selling, mm -hmm. that's just insane, right? 
it's so you know because everyone has confidence in their idea when they launch oh we're going to change the world we're going to do this we're going to do that but most of them will fail and most of them will be wrong so why would right. you not spend a, why would you not spend a bit of time and resources on minimizing the chance that you're wrong because it's not difficult to do that i mean it, it requires a certain amount of discipline and skill but it's not rocket science and it's not impossible so spend a bit of time doing it and you just slash your chances of failure in half like it, for me it's insane that more startups don't do this and it and yeah. the thing is, it, it's not just at the the um new start level either i've spoken to people who run like accelerator programs for like series a businesses like for these companies have already got 50 members of staff and they're doing high-end deep tech stuff and the, the guy who i spoke to who runs this very high-end program was just like I still bash my head against a brick wall every day. These people have raised millions of pounds and they're still, you know, once they've raised millions of pounds, they think that's validation and it's not. They've raised millions of pounds. To, they still haven't found product market fit. So, you know, even at that stage, it's not just about the one and two man startups. It's like it goes all the way to the top. You know, there's a lot of companies that fail even after like series A, series B, series C because they never found product market fit. I'm going to ask you a bit more detailed questions, Neil, about that, because mm -hmm. that's, that's really interesting. And I'm just thinking, like, so the mom's test, it's a great recommendation for the book. Mm -hmm. I, I think everyone listening to this uh, live should, should, should have a read. Uh, and also visit Neil's website, which is coming on the screen right now. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a question for you, Neil, because, like, I have experienced, like, hands-on and it's hard to find time to speak with your clients, especially once your machine is running. You have like 10, 20, 50, 100 people on board and there's no time. And no one feels accountable to speak with customers. And what I observed is it's so much easier for people that have an actual location and they interact with clients face to face. Mm -hmm. so any, any business with physical operations, but then obviously there is a massive wave of digital product, SaaS, marketplace, where you would never even see or speak to your client, and it's all social media, the internet, and that's how you interact with your audience. Uh, how would you recommend to outreach to people? Would you go individually and then ask them the questions or how would you apply market validation at the growth stage? Like when you already get hundreds of users, like how, how would you check your platform, whether, you know, it's going in a good direction, like obviously numbers, traction going up, but uh, what's, what's your way of validating uh, mm -hmm. the market? So, like to say? so I, I focus a lot on, or most of the work I do is with, early stage startups mm -hmm. and for them i think the the process that i um that i recommend is like taking advantage of like sales people call it the yes ladder where you just get somebody to say yes to something small and then they're more likely to to give you a yes to something uh further up the line so generally i put out a very basic one page survey uh using social media email whatever and try and get it to as many of my potential target audience as possible and part of that is at the end you say hey we're building something for your for your sector if you're in let's say uh i don't know just recruitment recruitment tech you know you ask people who are in recruitment tech to fill out this survey um it takes them 30 seconds so people generally don't mind doing that and at the end say, hey, we're building something really exciting for um, your sector. If you'd be interested in having a very quick call with me, 15 minutes, I promise uh, we're not going to sell anything because we don't haven't actually built anything to sell to you yet. That's always a key thing for me is like, you know, you have to be honest and, uh, and say, look, we're not selling anything to you because we don't have anything to sell. But if you'd be interested in answering some more questions, I'd love to have a 15 minute call with you. And for me then, you know, that, if you can get 10% conversion rate on that, you get 100, 150 people to fill the survey out and 10 or 15 to say yes, they'll have a call. It's 
you'd be you'd be surprised at how many people even if they don't know you so you know you just kind of say look with i mean i'm i put i'll put a link in the chat in a moment but what um my surveys tend to look like is some very basic demographic data like who you are job title sector blah 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 and you kind of say look this is a uh, for people in the recruitment space so we only want those people to fill it out you ask them a couple of very basic questions like do you have problems with i don't know finding talents or but actually in a sense this data is not what you're looking for it's actually just to get the phone call because i think actually if you try to then find 15 people who would take a phone call from you cold that's quite difficult but actually if you can get a, a survey shared online social media copy some people in you know um and it, people are easier to reach on twitter right so you can find someone in your uh, sector you can just tweet them and say hey we're doing a recruitment tech thing we're building something really exciting could you just spend 30 seconds to fill out this form um, and generally people are inquisitive they want to know so if at the end there's like hey I'd like to chat to you for 15 minutes and um it's not a sales thing you know make sure because people hate being sold to right and rightly so and then the flip side, the, 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 the next thing of that is, A, you get to do your customer conversation. You get to speak to them, you know, as long as you've read the Mon test or you know how to do customer discovery calls correctly. Um, at the back of that, you've then got their email address and you can say to them at the end of the call, would you be interested if we, if we built this thing, can I give you a call in three months' time? And 99% of the time they go, yeah. So there's your... Right. You know, so you've got a bunch of leads as well. Like you've got your first customers. So, you know, it, it actually people, people can be a bit sniffy about using surveys for customer research because they're either too long and they just people don't fill them in or you can't get enough data in a quick and easy one. But actually for me, it's not about getting the data off the survey. It's about getting them into your, your research pipeline, which then hopefully becomes a sales pipeline. Mm, so that I really that, like it. Really. Yeah, so that I mean, you know, I'll uh, I'll um I'll put the the link uh, to that, and I think actually I've got a there's a link to an example. Um, uh, uh, let me just see here. I'll I'll sort that out in a second. But yeah, there's a link to an example survey that people can copy and um and steal. So yeah, I would strongly recommend uh, something along those lines, and it's just. You know, I've I've worked with a bunch of companies over the last sort of couple of years where once they start speaking to potential customers in the right way, it totally changes how they think about their product. And, you know, always for the better, right? Always for the better. But you have to go in with no ego and accept that it might kill this. These conversations might kill your business. You might find or it might not kill your business, but kill your idea. You might find that people don't care about what you're planning on building. Mm. So that's quite interesting because that's where the ego comes in, right? So the way I'm thinking, so first of all, Neil, if you can drop in a private chat uh, this mm -hmm. link, that would be awesome. And I'm going to add this to the live stream. Uh -huh, there we that's go. Great. And so I'm just going to gonna add this to the live stream. So like, and then I'm going to also post it in... Uh, I'm gonna post it on LinkedIn so everyone can uh, can see that. Okay, so uh, that's excellent. So uh, the the question here, okay, so uh, I, I really like the idea about uh, doing a cold cold outreach on Twitter. You go speak with your audience before you even build the product. Scope mm -hmm. this. Uh, some people would call it minimal lovable product. <laughs> uh, something that just you know gets gets people on the platform, gets some early traction, uh, gets uh, first few clicks, first few users. Uh, wow! I mean, there's nothing to not like about it. So uh, anything that everyone gets you should do that with your customers. Anything that gets you speaking with your customers is is. You know, and it's something. You know, and and speaking about you, you were talking about growth businesses. It, it, it's one of the first things they drop once they launch, um, and that can be uh, quite disastrous. You know, um, because they just get to the point where they just uh, decide, 
oh, we've, we've validated now, so we don't need to do any more, right? And actually, you, it's a continuous process. You need to constantly be doing it. Mm, excellent. So, Neil, I think we covered quite in depth this uh, product uh, market validation and how, how mm -hmm. to go about it. If you don't mind, uh, I'd love to move to the part where, where you mentioned the community. Can mm -hmm. you tell me a little bit more about what you're creating and how this can like support founders out there? Yeah, I mean, I realized a couple of years ago <clears throat> that I've always been a community builder uh, and it's not something I've done by uh, intentionally. It's just something that is just maybe in my nature or I've always kind of felt like if there was a problem, I tried to just get people together to fix it together rather than um, just uh, just sort of do a um, try and fix it on my own. I've always thought, well, you know, let's get 10, 20, 30, 500 people in a room when, you know, or in a virtual space, right, to fix this problem together. Um, and I've always found it incredibly powerful and it, it's always brought me a huge amount of opportunities. Um, so I get teased sometimes by my friends and say, you know, I, uh, I, I know everyone or I'm a king of networking or whatever. Or they say, oh, you know what? And I, I, can't, I don't like the concept of networking because it feels very cold. Um, I genuinely think, I mean, I, you know, I think they're the same thing, like networking to a degree is, is similar, but I've always kind of disliked the idea because it kind of always feels a little bit like a, a very commercially driven, impersonal kind of thing. Like I'm going to network in order to get some value out of this. I think when you build a community, you have to go in and do it without any expectation of success. You have to do it for the, or any expectation of reward, I should say. You have to do it for the love of it. But but if you do it genuinely, then the rewards are there. Um, so I've had astonishing opportunities. And also the, the, the value really is that you're very visible within your community uh, and it's very easy to find connections with people and find contacts. Um, I think for me, a lot of community building is about putting a flag in the sand and just saying, look, this is where we are. So with Cardiff Start, which is the sort of tech startup community of, of Cardiff, um, we at the time really had no way of finding out about each other because lots of startups were, were started, but they were either in stealth or they were in isolation or they were just operating in some co-working space on the edge of the city where nobody knew about them. But Cardiff Start like became this flag in the sand where everyone can go, ah, everyone's kind of over there, right? And we'll go over there because we go and meet some people. And of course, not everyone comes and not everyone, is, you know, community isn't for everyone. But actually um, having uh, a flag in the sand where people can go, oh, well, if I do want help and support, if I do want, you know, somebody to put their arm around my shoulder and tell me I'm doing the right thing or the wrong thing, then it's over there. Um, and community building on, you know, on the other side has become quite a big thing within startups now. And they're realizing actually building an audience through community is a fantastic way of, um, pro you know, p places like, I mean, for example, Product Hunt and uh, Indie Hackers, which is sort of coming on as a community. Um, and lots of spaces in tech are really, really built on community now. Um, so whether that's just you have a Facebook group associated with your product or something more embedded and thought through, community really seems to be like a bit of a buzzword, buzzword in the last few years. Um, and maybe, you know, as a result of us all being kind of quite isolated from each other for the last couple of years because of COVID, maybe it's going to take even, uh, even more importance. Um, but for me, it's just about connecting with people. Uh, and that in itself brings brings opportunities. You know, you you know someone who's a sort of professional uh, fundraiser. Um, you're a, you're very much a. Um, uh, it's all about who you know, right? It's all about the network rather than uh, you know uh, anything else. Is if you if you've got the right connections, then you can make magic happen. Well, I mean, just on the power of the community and connections, because that's. Like, if you want to grow the startup, and I'm sure, like, you get this all the time, like, Neil, I have a great product, but I don't have a CTO, or I need a CMO, or like, I need this, I need this type of people around me, I need investors. 
And if you're not part of the community, it's so hard to build this on the spot. It takes mm -hmm. time. So my recommendation to always would be like, listen, like relationships take time to build. You need to mm -hmm. go out, join your local communities, and it's brilliant what you've created in Cardiff. Because uh, especially I think it's, it's one of the comments in places which with not as well developed ecosystems. Like obviously if you live in London, you're gonna mm -hmm. find so many communities. Manchester is yeah. the same. But there will be a lot of places where there is like no one, uh, no one there. And uh, I really admire what you've done by creating the ecosystem by yourself. And can you tell me how this experience really was for you starting the community? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I certainly uh, can't take um, credit for doing it all myself. I mean, maybe I've got one of the loudest voices about it, but I, uh, but yeah, lots of other other people have been involved. Um, for me, it was um, came out of necessity, and again, I can't, you know, like I said earlier, I think my instinct is often to build a community around something. Uh, my instinct is often, if there's a problem, then build a community. Um, it's I think community building, unless you're getting paid to do it, is almost always incredibly hard work. I mean, it's incredibly hard work, even if you're being paid to do it, but it's very slow um, and it takes a long time. And, you know, you have to be very clear about what your outcomes are, what, you're, what you want to achieve with it. I think one thing that we made a mistake early on in Cardiff Start, because we were just a, a loose group of, uh, entrepreneurs and developers who just wanted to make things better we didn't quite have the focus that we perhaps should have had um, so that's one thing I would change if I did it now I'd have a very clear sort of manifesto of like these are the three things that we want to get done and you know we had conversations about that stuff but perhaps we weren't as focused as we should have been um, but yeah it's if it's, it's a side project or if it's something you do that's not um, to do with a job or to you know to do with a commercial endeavor it can be very very slow and it's a lifetime's work in some respects you know because you're constantly building community building network um, so yeah you never quite finish that job it's just maybe you just change the type of network that you have or the type of community you're building around you so um, yeah I uh, it's hard, I think, is the, the thing. And I think it's um, whether you're doing it for commercial or personal reasons, it's it's going to take a long time. Mm. Like out of personal interest, I, I really wonder, like for a community, how do you measure success of a community? Yeah, that's I mean, that's a, a conversation that's often often had uh, amongst community builders. Obviously, if, you, if there is a commercial benefit, um, say for example you uh, you've built a community around uh, a brand of watches or a, you know some sunglasses or something um i think that's relatively easy insofar as at least you can follow the you can follow the clicks right you can see the generation of content by the users and, and all that kind of stuff hmm. i think if it's not so much commercial thing and i think with um with what we did with Cardiff Start, because it wasn't really commercial, or certainly there was no private entity driving this, um, we found uh, it was difficult to measure success sometimes. Um, you know, we could see the numbers of people engaging was increasing, and that's the obvious thing, like how big is the community? And our community was continually growing, but actually sometimes when I was away out of the country for like a couple of years or when one of the co-founders was going through an uh, one of the uh, co-founders of the community was going through an exit we didn't have the time or resources to, to to devote to the community so what you see is engagement drops off so the community continues to grow but the engagement drops off and you know even something simple like um the number of replies to a facebook post or you know so th those are the kind of social media metrics that that you can kind of use especially if your community is generally in one place but i think coming back to what we were saying earlier like if you set your goals for your community early on so for us it would be like higher representation of cardiff in the national media as a as a tech hub as a tech cluster you know then you could measure number of 
news articles about it or in the national news or something. So, you know, it's, it's about defining those, those early stage goals that you want your, uh, you want your community to achieve for you. Um, and, and just working out metrics that, that make sense for that. But yeah, community building is a very human endeavor. And as such humans aren't human behavior is almost impossible to measure sometimes. So, so sometimes mm. you have to say, uh well it feels like it's doing well so you know it is doing well so you know it's uh it's not it's not always an exact science and it, it depends on the type of community you're trying to build so i have another question for you mm -hmm. and the question is for Cardiff Start, do you accept only businesses from around Cardiff or are you open to all types of businesses from all regions I mean, at the moment, Cardiff Start doesn't have a very specific remit. The um, We have a big Facebook group, which is very active and lively. Uh, we try to keep that Cardiff-ish. Um, okay. Just basically, from a selfish point of view, uh, it makes it easier for us to administrate if we haven't got, you know, because we're always getting requests for, uh, for members from all over the world, and we have no idea which ones of these are just going to start advertising watches in us. So we're very hot on self-promotion and you have to be quite careful about what you post so yeah generally we we try and keep it fair but obviously as you'll know you need a community that has connections to london or silicon valley you'd be crazy to not have a you know somebody so yeah look if somebody comes to us um from silicon valley and they're like hey i'm investing in silicon valley i'm looking to mm. find startups who are not overvalued because they're in silicon valley or not overvalued because they're in london uh can I join? We'd be like, come on in, welcome aboard. You know, so if you can bring value to the community, then of course we're 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 totally on board. So I'm just uh, adding this for our audience. If they uh, hmm. they'd like to see and join, that's the name of the group. You can find it on yeah. Facebook search Cardiff Start. So I have a look. There is over four thousand people in the group, which is very impressive. Uh, so uh, Neil. So I'm just trying to sum up a few things mm -hmm. here. So we have a product market fit, brilliant experience in the music industry, develop, you develop then the platform, you specialize now and mentor businesses around early stage product market validation. And now there is the community part of it. So that in my mind gives you the scale so you can really see the patterns and just saying that, can you tell me maybe a bit more what's in your pipeline now? What's on the horizon? Mm. Are there any products, uh, pieces you plan to develop, get to the market in your future? Yeah. So, I mean, I've when the pandemic hit in March last year, I realized that I was going to spend obviously a lot of time uh, staring at my laptop and not meeting people in real life. So I basically offered free mentoring to anyone who wanted it um and i put it on linkedin and twitter and uh some other places stack overflow and stuff and, and i i suddenly got overwhelmed with requests and i had to kind of close the floodgates a little bit but over the following year i did some like 120 150 free mentoring sessions with startups and the feedback i got was was great um but you know, I started because I was speaking to early stage startups a lot of the time. I started to know because I was doing basically one a day. I did one a day for months. Um, and uh, I found that it was there were some real trends that I, I noticed. And that was basically the main one was that startups don't validate properly um, or that they don't have any concept of how to do it properly. That's when I started doing those surveys. So again, I've got lots of friends and followers on social media who are entrepreneurs. And so I did this survey of like over a hundred startups and we got some interesting data out of that. And it was just like, you know, um, most people understand the importance of validation, but most people equally don't do it properly, right? Or don't do it at all. So then my thinking at the moment is uh, a friend of mine who is a former investor and uh, head of finance at a big startup studio uh, and I have been talking about how do we how do we re help startups reduce failure rate 
Uh, and we've been speaking to a lot of big organizations from uh, accelerator programs, universities, banks, and whatever, and doing lots of our own customer, uh, you know, taking our own medicine and, and speaking to our customers before we do, you know, before we start building anything. And so we're just on the verge of thinking about, you know, this is a quite a, a potentially a serious problem that we can solve. So uh, we've got some really interesting ideas around, uh, you know, building a platform to help startups reduce failure rates. Uh, you know, we, we're still not 100% sure how we're going to do it, but we've got some very strong ideas. Um, so, yeah, that that might be something that I spend a, a, a bit of time doing over uh, the next couple of years. That could be the the, the next uh, next big thing because um, I'm, I'm very excited about that. And I think uh, I'm very passionate about – it always breaks my heart when you see a startup that has – spent five years and maybe even raised a couple of small rounds and you take one look and you think that was never ever going to work but these are smart people right and it's just that they became obsessed with their own idea and they you know you know what breaks my heart and i see this all the time like so many times people come on this discovery calls they put savings of their lives tens hundreds of thousands sometimes solopreneurs or like uh, two yep. or three people and uh, at the core it's never been a business yeah or maybe it was but the, the pricing wasn't right and the, the business model wasn't right and it's, it's just that's why it's so important for anyone listening to join a community uh, there's so many programs out there there are communities that it's, it's so accessible these days so Everyone yeah. should do it. Uh, no one should like work on their own. Uh, uh, it's it, it's so important to build your product out there with your clients, as uh, Neil mentioned. Use Twitter, maybe wh whatever is your social strength, uh, and go speak with these clients. I, I think that's invaluable uh, uh, advice from you, Neil. And then as well, once again, like uh, have a read about this service article. Really important. And uh, Neil, I have a question for you because someone told me that there is a book you're writing. Uh, yeah, well, I'm, <laughs> I kind of, uh, I, yes, I'm writing a book about building community, uh, but it's, it's, it's very slow. Uh, and uh, I'm actually writing two books uh, because I, uh, it was one of those lockdown projects. Uh, and now suddenly I'm very busy again and I can't find time to sit down and write. But yeah, they're very slow projects. I don't, I'm, they're personal projects really. I don't think, uh, I'm not expecting to change the world or to pick up, get on the New York Times bestseller list. But I thought if ever I had the time to uh, write a book, uh, a short book, then, um, then now is the time. And actually Rob Fitzpatrick, the guy who wrote the mom test, um, has been writing a lot about how to write non-fiction books, you know, uh, that are that people want to read. Because I don't know about you, but ninety percent of the non-fiction books I read, I never finish because you get like halfway through and you go, okay, I kind of get what they're saying now, and I don't, you know, and it, you kind of feel like it's getting more and more padded. It's just padding. Like actually, the central idea is quite short um, and could have been like a series of blog posts or something. So, so I'm trying to take that ethos on board and, and write something that's short and um, useful. Um, so yeah, that's uh, hopefully maybe later this year, I'll have uh, finished something that uh, I can, I can use uh, to uh, hopefully help, help people who want to build communities uh and uh yeah that that's uh but that again that's a that's a secondary project so it's just just when i have the spare time to sit down and write which uh with the world opening up a little bit more over the last month or two has been less and less brilliant uh so neil i think we're slowly arriving at the end of this show so uh it was our first live event mm -hmm. uh, so uh thank you everyone who joined uh, the event we had a few people in the audience and uh, yeah, Neil, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing Hi. your experience, knowledge, and uh, yeah, all the advice, which I think it's so important for everyone to follow around product market validation, about uh, how you interact with your early customers, about uh, yeah, all the mistakes that you shared with us. I think that's absolutely invaluable to learn from others' mistakes and uh, don't repeat the same. Patterns. And I have a question for you, Neil. 
I have a question. If anyone in the audience would like to have a call with you, is that okay for them to go to the website? Yeah, of course. And... Yeah, absolutely. You can get in touch with me via my website or just neil at neilcocker.com. So e easily, uh, easy to contact. So um, yeah, absolutely. More than happy to chat. But thank you, Arthur. That was really good fun. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Neil. And yeah, have a great, uh, great rest of the day. You too. Cheers. Thanks. Bye.